Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features Jim Lee's Wildcats number 11, cover dated June 1994. The cover here, Eye Catching by Jim Lee, inked by Scott Williams, colours by Joe Chiodo. Featuring a new character, we don't have a cover caption um, indicating who or what she is, but she's a villain and an old enemy of Zealots, as it will turn out, and her name is Tapestry. So let's open this issue up to the credits and see what we have coming up inside. So the story is Gateway Part 2 uh, and the writer is Chris Claremont. So this is the continuation of the team up again between the creators of the best-selling single comic of all time, X-Men number one, Chris Claremont and Jim Lee on pencils, inks by Scott Williams and letters by Tom Orzakowski, the original letter of Uncanny X-Men and adjectiveless X-Men as well. And then we also have an interlude, so it's like a B story featuring Mr. Majestic and the stories by H.K. Proger, who wrote the backup story in the previous issue. And that issue, that backup story was penciled by Ryan Benjamin. He returns for this interlude story, inks by Tom McWheeney and letters by Richard Starkings and Comic Craft. And the colorist throughout the book is Joe Chiodo and his Wildstorm FX uh, team of digital uh, separators and colorists. So we've got a splash page here, and I like this because what we have is um, a trope of Claremont's that he's carrying over from the X-Men, where all the dialogue on this page is from the last page of the previous issue. So from the end of issue number 10, and I like that. So we get a fresh view on the last uh, episode of the previous issue. Um, on this splash page, we get all our uh, key characters here with the Troika here in the background, Slag, um, Harm, Attica, and um, uh, Void's rival, Providence, who, like Void, is powered by one of the orbs of power. Um, and we got the origin of all of that back in Wildcats number nine. So here we go. And this character here is Alabaster Wu, and he's a Chris Claremont uh, creation. So let's turn the page over and we have got a really dynamic double page spread again we have dialogue continued over from the end of the previous issue ending with uh voodoo's betrayal now she is possessed by an alien species the raksha and that's why she's betraying jacob uh, lord emp and uh, the wildcats and here we get a great action uh scene in this double page half spread here Really great work by Jim Lee on this one. Spartan realizes that Voodoo's led them into a trap. And uh, Voodoo always seems already uh, to have made contact with the Troika and she's in cahoots with them. So that's something that wasn't uh, plain at the end of the previous issue, but it is now. And so she uh, uh, complains to Attica to watch his aim because uh, he nearly fried her as well as Warblade. So Warblade blasted there, Maul getting ready to attack. And of course, Maul is a heavy hitter on the team. So, uh, and also <clears throat> uh, Void uh, is ordered by Spartan to teleport them out of there, but something is preventing her from teleporting. And that is her rival Providence, who says, we're both children of the orb, Void alike enough to be twins. We share the same genesis, we share the same powers. And that origin story, as I said um, a minute ago, is told in Wildcats number nine, so you can check out the review on that if you haven't done so already. And Providence continues, our only difference is the way and will we choose to use them, which means that anything you can do, I can do better. And that's the theme of Chris Claremont's uh, writing on the X-Men as well. Rivalries, competitiveness between heroes and villains. And um, there we go. And then we have a scene change. And we have first person narration here. Cool bike, way cool driver. Even if she's sick as death. Raksha, poison, septic as sin. Anyone else, they'd be dust and done. So that's a reference to the fact that Zealot in the previous issue, part one of the storyline, was wounded by one of those Raksha aliens um, in, the, in the gut, in the stomach. And, um, and the Huntsman here, uh, did his best to uh, help uh, salve and bind her wound. Um, but Zealot's ignoring it because she's on a mission to get to the other Wildcats <clears throat> and warn them of Voodoo's possession. 
So we have this cool anchor image of um, a bullet, uh, Zealot's bullet, bullet bike with a sidecar as well. So it's kind of comical here with Huntsman, uh, no doubt, uh, squeezed into that sidecar. And also it implies that when Voodoo, or sorry, when Zealot took Voodoo out for training in the previous issue, uh, Voodoo must have been riding in that sidecar. And this isn't the bullet bike that Zealot won from uh, Grifter in issue number eight. So Jim Lee doing um, a new design here. And in fact, this is a good point to say that Jim Lee um, has done, uh, in my view, um, a better uh, penciling job on this issue than the previous one. It seems maybe to me that he's relaxed into uh, the old uh, dynamic of working with Claremont scripts. And maybe also he's past the point of designing all the new characters. And so he's just relaxing into the storytelling and spending more time on that as well as backgrounds um so the first person narration continues she calls this place brooklyn big part of a bigger city not much action this time of night streets pretty deserted good thing i figure because zealot isn't giving anybody much of time to get out of our way so they're speeding along and huntsman asks is it wise to go so fast it's necessary the comlink codes have been scrambled the team has gone totally offline so she has their current position nothing more so that she's racing to get to them and she uh, uh, continues uh, with her dialogue with Huntsman. But what I want to focus on here is the hatching lines by Scott Williams in the inks. And in particular, how he's rendered this uh, chain mail on Zealot's shoulder and upper arm. And this is a little um, flourish of uh, Williams that I think he figured out how to do this. Uh, back in issue number nine on Entropy's armor, which also was chainmail. And I think he must have liked it and Jim Lee must have liked it. And so here it is again. And I like it is a point I'm making here. And Huntsman is charged with guarding this young girl. Her name is Miranda Tai, and she's a princess of some royal line, uh, wherever these people are from. It's uh, not clear yet to readers. And so he's insisting that uh, he and uh, the child are gonna to stick together even though Zealot thinks that uh, the child won't be safe where they're going. And then the first person narration, my guy, all the way. So that is the perspective we were getting um, in those first person narration uh, captions on this particular page. It's the princesses. And then we're back to the fight um, in Lower Manhattan. And so we've got some nice action sequences here as uh, Spartan goes up against the Troika and Maul 2 leaping into action. And this is an interesting bit here where Attica uh, uh, connects up with H-A-R-M, Harm, uh, the robot member of the Troika. So here he says, join cyber systems in Ops Sync. I have control of the weapons array. Target Maul acquired and locked into the Matrix. And then he says, <clears throat> in his own voice, have to strike fast before he begins growing. The bigger that lump gets, the harder to nail. So he is um, uh, targeted by harm and blasted. And uh, Attica uh, then beats, like punches Maul out. So then harm is scanning for secondary targets. He uh, locks on. Uh, Alabaster Wu, who's picked up um, a sidearm from Jacob Marlowe. And then Voodoo, possessed by the Raksha, uh, saves Wu from being shot by harm. And um, why might she have done that? So she says here, too many, too many of the brethren have gone to glory thanks to you, but you will follow Alabaster Wu. If that you have my most solemn vow, to serve them as a slave until the end of time. So who was she saving the guy for? Well, then we have new characters arriving and the click clacking of high heels. And here they are. So this is our villain from the cover. And who is this guy that's with her? So he says, we've need of this one. And Voodoo replies, so it has been written, Lord Soma, so it shall be done. So Soma is the Greek word for body. And then we're going to discover what powers these two have over the course 
of the remainder of the issue. So we learn her name as well, poor things. I hope they haven't been too badly damaged. Doesn't matter tapestry, so that's her name. I suppose not. And then they've got these um, attack dogs with them as well, these Doberman dogs. I suppose not heel puppies, behave yourselves. You can play later. So um, a nasty character. And uh, she compliments Attica on uh, a job well done. So these are the Troika now are operating as a mercenary team. And he's warning her and Soma about uh, Zealot and Grifter. We're short too, though, the most dangerous of the bunch, Grifter and his babe Zealot. But Tapestry responds, say that to her face, Attica, and you might well lose your own. A zealot is no one's babe. So that implies a past history between the pair, which of course we'll learn a little bit more about as the issue progresses. And then what's her interest? She's interested in Jacob Marlowe and says, hello Jacob, I've waited so long to meet you. Meanwhile, Soma pays um, Attica with access codes to the appropriate bank cache in Zurich. Um, and then Attica goads him by saying, what a waste. A looker like her mooning over that toadstool. That don't bother you, Soma? I guess not. And look at this guy's face, his dead eyes, the milky color, the milky blue of his um, irises uh, with no pupils. Very interesting design. Um, and a different body type from Jim Lee as well. This long, lean, thin uh, figure that he's, uh, that he's designed for Soma. And also, Look at the background work here at the construction site that they're in. You know, there's no need, uh, technically speaking, for this because it's already established earlier in the issue that they're fighting on a construction site. But that's what I'm saying. He's spending more time on the penciling of this issue and is adding in backgrounds like that. And it's appreciated. It's, uh, it's good work from Jim Lee on this particular issue. So, um, Attica, his point about making a major mistake, ignoring Grifter and Zealot, um, persuades Soma and Tapestry to rehire him to take out uh, Grifter, but his sister Zealot, but sister Zealot rather, is to be delivered unharmed. And then Voodoo's hungering because uh, her host is resisting her as i consume her flesh i strengthen her will if this shell expires i will require another so she seems to be um uh, suggesting maybe that alabaster woo might do the trick but um there's a debate among the pair voodoo's abilities are useful says soma it would be a shame to lose her um and tapestry says i require alabaster woo healthy Raksha, she says to Voodoo, Lord, likewise Lord Emp and his pets, be patient, we'll find you dinner soon enough. Okay, so what do they need Wu for? Well, we don't find out in this particular issue, but we will find out what she wants. We'll find out a little bit what she wants from um, Emp in this issue or what she wants to do to him. And then I really like this particular page. So Zealot and Huntsman have arrived and they're surveilling um, in shadows uh, the scene of the Wildcats defeat. Uh, looking down at them being led into, taken prisoner into this warehouse. And as they're talking, um, uh, who's saying this? Is it, uh, I think it might be um, Zealot who's speaking. The Troika appeared to be the only combat personnel. This is almost too good to be true. And then, look, Tapestry looks right up um, Huntsman's lens, as he says. The pair in cloaks seem to be calling all the shots. The anyone you know, he asks her. And it seems like she recognizes her. Blessed Hecate, she exclaims. So, Zealot uh, makes an immediate decision that they have to go. Huntsman realizes that she knows who this is, but she won't answer his questions and they leave immediately. So that just really conveys to the reader that whoever Tapestry is, whatever her powers are, she is a major threat and has alarmed Zealot seriously. And that's not the Zealot we know. So what is it about this character that could 
have um, put the fear into this into Zealot in the form that um, she's done. So Zealot gets on her cellular. Again, it looks like um, this is. You see, the implication is that this is the princess's first-person narrations, but I think that at this point it's supposed to be Huntsman, so that's a little bit ambiguous, but in any case, Zella gets on the phone to Savant, shaking so hard she can barely punch the numbers. The mood's infectious. I mean, Zella tore into a shipload of Rakshas without batting an eye. She's as strong and honed as her blades, face her with the devil. She'd spit in his eye, yet one look at that woman and she's on the run. Who the heck is she? So that's everything I was saying earlier. Um, it's all as plain as day in the, uh, in the storytelling of the previous page. So here we're inside the warehouse and we can see that uh, Tapestry and Soma have had the wildcats strung up, stripped and strung up from the ceiling. Except for uh, Void here, who is uh, hu uh, hung from the ceiling, but is facing the right way up. And um, Soma's dismissing Providence, saying their business is concluded. But Providence insists that she wants Void. She wants Void left to her. And Tapestry says she's integral to the set. It cannot be broken. And when Providence doesn't back down, Tapestry simply says to her, you're a fool, and sets her Doberman's on her. That's a great um, anchor image there. And interesting, you know, Claremont is setting Jim Lee some uh, challenges uh, in the artwork because it's doubtful that Lee would uh, have, you know, in any one of his stories with Brandon Choi, an image like this of dogs jumping on one of the characters. So definitely uh, Claremont's script challenging Lee in his artwork. And then we've got one of those classic Lee layouts where the bottom panel is borderless and we have small figures uh, conveying the action really nicely done here so tapestry grabbing Providence by the cloak and then flinging her into void and then they seem to uh, blend together and tapestry gives us a little bit of insight into what exactly her um, um, history might be. So she implies that she's lived more than the span of a single human lifetime and she says that she's the weaver of souls, the shaper of fate. Um, and then we get a little bit about what Soma's powers are. I've spun them to the border of the dreamlands, Domina. And Domina is the Latin for um, female lord, so mistress. So she's the one who's the superior um, of the pair all are in their most receptive state. So he seems to have power over the whole body and um, has put them into um, a, a kind of like a sleep state where they're going to be suggestive, or sorry, suggestible rather. So um, Tapestry um, invites um, Providence to bear witness to the exercise of true power. And so that is what Tapestry is all about the acquisition and exercise of power. As the boundaries between flesh dissolve, she continues, so too will soul and self merge until nothing remains of the women that were, save power, that I will yield. Like double-headed Janus, void and providence will light my path through eternity and protect me from my every enemy. And then she turns her attention to Emp and says, as for you, champion of the Caribbean, and then she exercises her power here. And interesting that Claremont lets Jim Lee's art do the storytelling. No captions, no dialogue. I like it. So what happens is she touches his chest. We get this energy effect around his head, something emerging from his forehead. She's smiling there wickedly. And then we have this image of his head bound that's um, uh, come out of his skull. So what has gone on here? Well, and his, uh, like this image of, of him is weeping and she tastes <laughs> his tears saying, is it so awful a thing to have your essence torn from your body? So that's his soul, psyche soul. 
don't worry I'll put it back she says as she sucks her thumb and that's a great image there that top down shot of uh, Jacob's head upside down um, his physical head and she continues not only not quite the way I found it such a long and eventful life such vivid imagery how sad so much seems lost to you who stripped you of your memory Marlowe and why have you ever wondered shall I help you remember perhaps another time so a story for another day let's begin with something something closer to home and here we go way back to an episode from issue one of Wildcats the debut of your precious Wildcats and that's as I said issue one a scene from issue one where these guys um, um, attacked Voodoo in the um, in the uh, exotic dancing club where she was performing give us the dancer or the runs a head shorter somebody take out this dirt bag now I can make the shot and that's Brandon Choi's dialogue so that's a nice nod from Chris Claremont uh, you know to the original writer and the original um, story not changing that dialogue but letting it stand and then we have what we remember from the first issue Zealot arriving uh, taking out the guy who had um, Jacob uh, held <clears throat> with a gun to his head and so it was Zealot's arrival and here Tapestry has a plan um, to break up the bond that was forged that nothing could break the fast friendships made in the original adventure and this was Marlowe's uh, dialogue from um, the end of issue 4 as long as the sun shines and the wind blows there'll always be tomorrow and it'll be up to, it'll be up to people like us to make sure it's always a better one than the one before so again Brandon Choi's original dialogue so I like that and then we have um, a switch of scene and there is a lot of work on these two pages here so it turns out the location is the Smithsonian uh, Museum and we have this professor academic type going up to this uh, new character and uh, talking about the statue that she's studying and he says to her indications are this was a triptych so that there was three statues but there's no record of the other two figures and she says in reply so the provenance says and he says well I compiled the provenance the notes on the statue and he says I've made Antiochus of uh, Phrygia my life's work he was a fascinating man soldier and statesman a strategist some say to rival his best friend Alexander the Great so we're stretching all the way back here to the 4th century BC fascinating isn't it how fate casts one as a benchmark chapter in human history and relegates the others to barely a footnote so he introduces himself Charles Russell but Jim Lee has drawn him like Chris Claremont back in 1994 that is the image of Chris Claremont so a little kind of in joke there um, from Lee to his uh, uh, writer compatriot on the on this issue and the woman introduces herself as Cordelia Matheson and we get our first good look at her face there so he knows her name this entire wing of the Smithsonian's your grandmother's bequest she was quite a lady so they say she actually worked with Harry Lucas of the University of Chicago and she responds they were a pair all right the Bonnie and Clyde of mid-century archaeology and he says I wish I'd known her look if you aren't terribly busy can I interest you in a cup of coffee so he's quite the chancer eh and so she says it'd be nice but she gets a phone call so who is the call from just the dialogue doesn't give any indication this is a surprise she says that's that news is not a surprise so she says just hang on okay I'll be along as quickly as I can so she apologizes to uh, the professor and says rain check on the invite call you when I'm back okay so um, he's pleased at his luck <laughs> in uh, in that regard that's a nice top-down shot here as I said lots of work on these pages from Jim Lee and then we're in um, her office and she says to herself way too much like Harry for my own good and that's our hint that her grandmother was actually her and probably for his but this other thing 
I told you, Zealot, I told you. So she's savant. She's received the phone call from Zealot. It's a small world. And that has to be in relation to um, tapestry. So the mystery is deepening. And we're getting little hints as regards connections between all these different characters. So Savant gets into her costume here. And here also in the foreground on the table, we see some interesting little details here. The princess bar, we've obviously got, um, where's the name again? Harry, um, where's his name in the dialogue over here? Harry Lucas. That has to be him here, and that's her there. That's Savant. And here is um, Antiochles of Thrygia, and here are the other two figures missing from the original triptych. So Savant has it. That's really, really interesting. So she's talking to herself there um, um, regarding uh, Zealot's foolishness about maybe her hope it's implied that they'd never meet um tapestry again <clears throat> and then she calls soldier and he's a guy that we learned a little bit about in the b story of the previous issue number 10 and that he was recruited by zealot during the korean war so um he implies that maybe they have a bit of a beef but when he realizes that um he's needed he says to her, tell me where and what's needed, kid. I'm on my way. So she directs him to Brooklyn, the waterfront, near the Navy Yard. The Troika's on Zealot's tail, so you shouldn't have any trouble finding her. And he asks her, you ain't coming? And she says, I need mag uh, Majestic. Um, and Soldier says, he ain't worth the, w the effort. Zealot's facing Tapestry Soldier, she says. If we can't save Zealot, if worse comes to worst, he's the only one of us with strength enough to kill her. So again, this is um, emphasizing uh, the threat level of this new character, Tapestry. And I really like the storytelling sequence here where we see um, Savant using her power where she can take these mighty leaps. And she is going all the way from the Smithsonian in Washington to Chicago to Calgary, 70 kilometers from Calgary. She's over the Canadian border uh, to Fairbanks. It's nicely done in one, it, the, the implication is almost like it's one leap, but I think it's a series of leaps that she's doing. Um, and then we're back to Tapestry and the head game she's playing with Marlow. And now we see what she's up to. She changes his memory of what happened by having Zealot kill Grifter and then attack him. And then he's defended by tapestry so she's messing with his head and kills zealot in his memories and um he now trusts her and she tells him here place yourself in my hands jacob and all will be well i offer armor against all attacks and strength enough to crush your every foe all you need do my sweetling is give yourself to me wholly and unreservedly and now he's in this strange leather garb um, and he looks like um, he is her slave and of course there's a subtext here there's a kind of s and subtext to the whole thing she owns him now body and soul and this is like a grand theme of Claremont's work all the way back in the X-Men to the corruption of uh, heroes uh, not just like not just body but also soul like complete corruption and that's what she's done here uh, with Marlow and now he's her slave so and a note to um, Jim Lee lavishing a full page on this um, a climactic image as well it looks good so as I said like really great strong work from Jim Lee on this issue um, definitely not shirking on uh, the work. Lots of uh, backgrounds in, in, um, in the panels. Excellent stuff from Lee. Next up, A Gathering of Eagles. But we do have that interlude. It's a very short story at the back, I think six pages. So, and I like this opening, uh, the storytelling here where we're zoomed in on this hammer 
and then we zoom out like the camera pulls back and then we see this uh, uh, boot um, moving towards uh, the uh, the top-down angle on the house and it is Savant she's arrived at her destination hello Lord Majestic nice place you've got here she says as she alights a little remote but nice energy barrier is a great touch really keeps the chill out and he asks her how did you find me Savant my location was meant to be a secret so Majestic in the Wildstorm universe is um, an analog of Superman from the DC universe and she basically makes the point that he is the most powerful being on the face of this planet and tells him he can't, she, he can't hide up there forever. It's an, an analogy to Superman um, retreating to his fortress of solitude. That's, what, that's what's going on here subtextually. So Majestic says he can't go back. He wants to be left alone. And then she's got something in her bag that she shows him and asks him, do you recognize this? And it shocks him. So he takes it in his hand. We can't see what he's looking at. And she says, how did I find it? Acquiring knowledge things, that's what I do. Savant is kind of like an Indiana Jones figure, a female Indiana Jones figure um, in the Wellstorm universe. Um, and uh, interesting here, like what she says about what she does, acquiring knowledge and things like an archeologist. Um, yeah, good. So Majestic is persuaded and he says, maybe it's time for me to face the failure to try to make amends. So he committed some kind of sin and that's why he retreated to his fortress of solitude. And he says here, if Zealot needs me, she will have the aid of Mr. Majestic. So he transforms into his um, alter ego with his costume on. Whatever his power set is, we don't know yet. And Savan says, you know, we, we should really have a talk about that name. So an implication, you know, that Majestic is the equivalent of a golden age um, hero which of course is what Superman is originally, um, going all the way back to 1938 for his creation. So then um, Majestic says, let us go Savant, I'm eager to once again bring justice to the world, very Superman-like. Good, she says, then I guess I won't be needing this anymore. And whatever that is, she drops it to the ground, turn the page, and it's an old raggedy doll. No, it had served its purpose, he says. For what it represents is burned into my soul. I've made bad choices. I've done grave wrongs. I'm guilty of things that plague my dreams, but that cannot change my responsibilities. I have a duty to this planet and I cannot let doubt bury me again. So whatever this doll represents, some girl's lost childhood, perhaps. Um, interesting, yes? We didn't know at the time yet. It, everything was being hinted at. And again, I like the book ending of the five uh, horizontal panels and the camera, like the, um, our perspective, like pulling back, back, back. And as the snow falls, the house being covered over. That's really nice. Nice opening page, nice concluding page on this. Ryan Benjamin's work, much better on uh, this backup story than the one in the previous issue, which featured Soldier. So then we have um, the letters page, two pages of letters some uh, readers artwork there not too bad of mole and zealot an ad for the cartoon and an ad for gen 13 number zero well i do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on wildcats number 11. if you did please like the video on youtube and if you haven't done so already subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this